Today's video is brought to you by AG1. Head to drinkag1.com slash Kendall Ray to get a year's supply of vitamin D3K2 drops plus five travel packs for free with your first order. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So happy to have you here with me today to discuss yet another case. And if you're new, then welcome. My cat does not want to be here. Cats are going to cat. Anyway, before I jump in today, I have two quick announcements. One, I wanted to remind you guys of the Neckmex Summer Collection. It is still available. It's going to be available for a couple more weeks. So if you want any items from that collection, you can find them at milehiremerch.com. And as a reminder, 100% of the profit from that collection is going directly to National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They're amazing. You guys know, I mean, we've talked about NECMEX so many times and the work they do. It is so vital and important. It's really a great organization to donate to, and it's really a win-win for you. I mean, you get a shirt, 100% is donated. No brainer. Also, I have another big announcement. I have revamped my YouTube membership. So we are now going to be offering a bunch of perks. And for so long, you guys have been asking me to have access to ad-free versions of my content. And now you can. You can become a member to this channel right here on YouTube. It's super easy to do. You'll find it somewhere below. And not only will you be supporting my content, my team, and all the projects that we're working on, as you know, we're working on a documentary right now, and it's costly to produce a documentary, but also you will get my content 100% ad-free and 24 hours in advance. Plus, there are some other perks. You get custom emojis. You get to do members-only chat on all my premieres. My content will now be premiering. There will also be loyalty badges for those who have been a member for a while. It will highlight how long you've been a member, and a little icon will display by your name when you comment in chat based on how long you've been a member. There will be custom emojis for members to use in chat and on premieres. We will also be doing merch giveaways and a monthly discount code for merch for members that will be updated every month. We also have a private case request form, so there will be member requested topics. So I'm really excited about it. It's going to be something new. I'm excited to try it out. And 10% of your membership will be donated every month to National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So if you are interested, you can check that out. And thank you in advance to all of you who become members. It means a lot to me and my team. I know a lot of you will ask, there won't be any exclusive case coverage for members. I just don't believe in putting anyone's case behind a paywall. These cases need as many eyes as possible, and I wouldn't want to keep anyone from hearing my coverage. And I want to make it clear that nothing is changing about this channel, so don't fret. This is purely an add-on for those who want to become members, but you'll still get the same uploads from me, the same schedule. Everything's staying the same. This is just a bonus for those who want to support the channel. All right, let's go ahead and get into this case here. This is one that I have wanted to talk about for a while now. Today, we're going to be talking about Crystal McDowell, who disappeared the day before Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas. I'm sure so many of you remember that. A lot of you probably lived through it and experienced it. Hurricane Harvey was absolutely devastating, and it was probably one of the worst times for someone to go missing. Let me start out by telling you about Crystal. Crystal Ann Surratt was born on October 26, 1979 in Harris County, Texas, to her parents, Pamela and Anthony. Crystal had a pretty tough go from the beginning. She had a very strained relationship with her parents because of their drug use, and they both ended up passing away within months of each other when Crystal was only 11 years old. And if that weren't devastating enough, when Crystal was 13 years old, there are sources that say she was kidnapped and held in a chicken coop until she was able to escape. Now, there's very minimal information out there about this. We don't know who was taking care of her at the time she was abducted or what that experience was like for her or the outcome of it all, but I did want to mention it. Eventually, though, things did start looking up for her. She ended up moving in with her uncle Jeff and was properly taken care of by members in her family. But it wasn't an easy childhood by any means, as you can imagine. But Crystal was determined to work as hard as she could and create a better life for herself. So in her mid-20s, she meets a man named Steve McDowell. Her aunt Cindy said that Crystal was, quote, very smitten the day that she met him and really believed that she met the man of her dreams. And in 2007, they got married. Now, like so many relationships, from the outside looking in, 
many people believed that they had it all, that it was a great relationship, that they were both really happy, but the truth was things were not great. Crystal was actually working as a flight attendant at the time for ExpressJet, and on top of constantly being away from home, she was known to be unfaithful to her husband. She had a handful of affairs, and that definitely impacted their relationship. But from what I've learned, she was not the only one causing issues. Both her and Steve were said to be very toxic to each other, and that toxicity just worsened as the years went on. In fact, back in 2008, Crystal had actually filed for divorce, but she ended up staying with Steve because he threatened to kill himself if she left. Clearly, this is not a good foundation for a marriage, and they really struggled, but for a long time, they tried to make it work. They ended up having two kids together, a boy and a girl, and for the next several years, things seemed to be improving for them. Eventually, Crystal decided to leave her job as a flight attendant, and she became a real estate agent in Baytown, Texas, where she'd grown up her entire life. And Crystal ended up being incredible incredibly successful in her career and was the breadwinner for their family. Crystal did a lot to support her husband, to support her children. She wanted to give them the life that she never had. And she was such a passionate, loving mother. She cared about her kids more than anything in the world. She was very active on social media. And just by looking at her posts, you can tell that her world really did revolve around her kids. Even with her busy work life, she always made time for their family. But she always struggled to make things work in her marriage. And in 2017, after 10 years of marriage, she ended up deciding it was finally time to leave. And she filed for divorce once again. And just like when she tried to leave the first time, Stephen, yet again, threatened his life. And this time she was not going to give into his mind games. She was determined she needed to get out of this relationship. And when threatening his own life didn't work to make Crystal stay, he ended up threatening his children's life. He said he would kill them first and then himself. And she confided in a few people about what he had said, but it hasn't been reported anywhere that she told authorities what he said he would do if she left him. And here's the thing. It's not like Crystal threatened to divorce him and take their kids and then never see him again. She actually set Stephen up pretty well. She bought him a nice house to live in and even agreed to live in that house with him and the kids while her own town home was being renovated. Crystal didn't want to make this transition any harder on the kids than it needed to be. And even though they were sleeping in separate bedrooms and the kids knew something was off, she wanted to make the transition as smooth as possible. So Crystal was really being as kind as possible to Stephen as they're getting divorced. She had stated that their relationship had really started to feel like brother and sister. It was hitting that roommate phase and she didn't even feel like they were married anymore. So the divorce was finalized in June of that year. And up until that point, Crystal had been completely financially supporting Stephen. So she's trying her best to make this as easy as for all of them as possible. And living with your ex-husband obviously isn't ideal and she did want to move on with her life. So she started dating someone else while she was still living with Steven. The summer that the divorce was finalized, she began dating a local jeweler named Paul Hargrave. She and Paul spent a good amount of time together and their relationship really grew quickly. However, she was still living with Steven and the kids. And as you can imagine, since Steven clearly did not want the divorce in the first place, he was not too keen about her moving on and dating someone else. It has been said by many that he had a sort of obsessive love for her and the idea of her being with someone else drove him crazy. And of course, Crystal knew that that would be his reaction. So for a while, she tried to keep Paul a secret. He was clearly the jealous type. And at one point that summer, Crystal told a friend that she was afraid that he had been tracking and following her. And it sounds like he had always kind of been this way in their relationship, but there seemed to be one event that really set him off. Before they split up, Stephen, Crystal, and the kids had planned to take a cruise together as a family. And if I'm not mistaken, some of her other family, like her uncle who raised her, were also going to be there. But after their divorce was finalized, Crystal decided to invite Paul instead. So to be clear, she invited Paul, even though Stephen was also going to be there. And as you can imagine, he was not going to be down with that. And Paul also thought it was weird and was uncomfortable. So instead of uninviting him, she uninvited Stephen. So all of this created a lot of drama, as you can imagine. But unfortunately, this trip would never even happen. Because on August 25th, 2017, Crystal McDowell went missing. So the night before, she stayed with Paul. 
And she woke up Friday morning and got all her stuff together and had to be back over at the house for Steven because he had to go to work and she needed to take care of the two kids. And later that day, she had two house showings. And there's actually security footage of Crystal walking around Paul's house, getting ready to go around 7 a.m. And she actually leaves the house around 7.10. Now, this is the last time that Crystal was seen. But as I mentioned earlier, she disappeared the day before Hurricane Harvey. For those of you who don't know, it started off as a tropical wave off the coast of Africa on August 12th and then traveled across the Atlantic Ocean and was preparing to make landfall that very next day, Saturday the 26th. The storm was quickly gaining speed and reached its peak intensity as a Category 4 hurricane on the 25th. It was absolutely insane. Winds were reaching up to 130 miles per hour and people all over Texas and Louisiana were making their final preparations for what was to come. Now, personally, I've lived in Colorado my whole life. I've never experienced a hurricane, but I'm sure any of you out there who have know how scary this time can be just prepping for what's to come. I can only imagine how terrifying it must be to not know if you're going to lose your home, your cars, for some people, their pets and experience devastation at such a catastrophic level. And I'm sure Crystal had at least a little anxiety about what was coming. She knew she had to get back to her kids and make sure that they were all prepared for what was to come. And as I mentioned, she had two house showings scheduled for that day, but they were both canceled due to the storm. However, she wouldn't have made it to those showings if they hadn't been canceled. Because after leaving Paul's house, nobody had seen or heard from her. Paul says that he tried texting and calling her, but he figured she was busy trying to get prepared for the storm. Now, Stephen said he also didn't hear from her, even though he knew she was supposed to come home for the kids that morning. But neither Paul or Stephen called the police and reported her missing. Paul actually did reach out to her Uncle Jeff, saying that you know he couldn't get a hold of her and asking if he knew where she was. And it wasn't until the next day, the 26th, that her Uncle Jeff ended up making the report. By this point, everyone was really concerned because Crystal was not the type of person to not get back to her friends and family. She was constantly in touch with people and everyone knew that something had to be really wrong. She never would have just left without telling someone, especially with this massive hurricane headed their way, which was another huge concern. So the hurricane makes landfall on the 26th. This is the same day that the police are alerted that she is missing. And as you can imagine, with this hurricane starting, it made starting an investigation extremely difficult. Not only were the streets flooding with water, but 911 and emergency teams were very preoccupied with rescue efforts. And many of these investigators were dealing with the devastation firsthand. Their homes were flooded, but most of them still showed up on Sunday to work with the intention of looking for Crystal. But above all else, they were certain that she was not a victim of the hurricane, so they turned to her friends and family to try and learn more, figure out where she could have gone. And at first, investigators actually thought that her uncle Jeff knew more than he was letting on. Even though he was first to report her missing, he did make the investigation harder. First of all, he actually went to Crystal's home that weekend despite the hurricane and could have possibly tampered with a potential crime scene. And I'm sure that wasn't intentional. I mean, when someone goes missing, you're just going to do everything you can think of to do. And I'm sure he thought going to the house would be helpful. Obviously, that was a mistake, but he also did hire a private investigator. But investigators felt like that was odd because they were already doing the job. So they were suspicious of him. But there were two other people that investigators had their eyes on that seemed more likely to have been involved. Obviously, that was Paul and Stephen, two men who had relationships with Crystal, who had access to Crystal, and who had both not reported her missing. Now, when it came to Stephen, he was very helpful and cooperative with officers. He offered any information that he could. He offered to help in any way he could. He told them about their marriage and how it ended. But he said it was very amicable, which we all know is not true. But, you know, he explained to them, we're still living together for our kids, even though we're not together. And from the outside looking in, that sounds pretty good. These two are still living together to make things work with their kids. They must be friendly. 
Stephen said that he got a text from Crystal the morning she disappeared around 7 a.m. saying that she was on her way home. Specifically, the text said, on my way, do you have water? Looks like I might stay here with the kids. It seems just like rain. And this is the last time he claimed to have heard from her. Now, there's also an alleged text from her that came in at 9.30 a.m. that said that she had changed her mind and she was going to pick up the kids and take them to Dallas. I'm not sure if this text actually exists. This is what Jeff, her uncle, told the police. And he said that he had seen it on Stephen's phone, but this has never been corroborated. So from the beginning, most of the investigators, I say most because not all of them, felt that Stephen was innocent. And they're more unsure about Paul and Jeff. And one thing about Stephen's interviews with police is he kept saying that they should look into Paul. He was sus of Paul, and so was Jeff. Jeff is also telling them that they should look into Paul. Jeff even told investigators that he felt Stephen was a good guy and that he would never do anything to Crystal. But Paul, he wasn't so sure. He said that their whole family had a bad feeling about Paul. And considering he was the last person to see her, it was starting to look more and more likely that maybe Paul had something to do with her disappearance. And when looking into Paul, huge red flags came up. Remember that home security footage I showed earlier of Crystal walking through and leaving Paul's house? Well, Paul handed it over to the media before he handed it over to police. And there wasn't anything incriminating about that footage, but they felt like that was really strange. So this is only really fueling the idea that maybe Paul was involved. But before they even had a chance to really look into him, they got their first big break. On Monday the 28th, Crystal's car was found partially submerged in a Motel 6 parking lot located about 13 miles away from where she lived. A family member actually got a text from someone who said that they'd received a Snapchat with a video of the car, and that's when they realized it belonged to a missing person. And because the streets were still so heavily flooded by this point, the police had to take an airboat to reach the car. And when they did, they realized that the keys were still inside. And they started to think that maybe someone ditched it and hoped that the car would be stolen. But the question was, who did it? And was their plan to have her car stolen, ruined by the flooding from the hurricane? Or is it possible that the hurricane was part of the plan all along. So her very flooded car was eventually towed to a crime scene lab. And unfortunately, the water had completely washed away any potential evidence. See this black car right here? This Mercedes. Crystal McDowell's car was found submerged in this Motel 6 parking lot, roughly 13 miles from her home. The cops were here busting in doors to find out where this lady is. Police say it was likely parked here before the water rose. As the days began to pass and the roads began to clear, two things happen. One, it becomes extremely clear that Crystal did not run away. There was no activity on her phone, no activity on her bank accounts, and without her car, it's obvious that she would have likely been found by now. And second of all, by this point, investigators and the media really started to pick up steam. A Texas Ranger came in to work on the case, and he was determined to find answers. How confident are you that she was not a victim of this storm? I'm very confident. She is not a victim of the storm. We, we've, we feel very, very confident that she's not a victim of this storm. Chambers County Sheriff Ryan Hawthorne says the investigation began before the storm, but Harvey's aftermath has made their efforts more challenging. We are hampered by some of the flood issues, but we are as aggressive as ever trying to locate and find uh, Crystal McDowell. And at this point, investigators still couldn't agree on who to focus their energy on. Was Stephen involved? Was Paul involved? Is it possible her uncle Jeff was involved? And because they had several persons of interest, progress on the case actually started to slow down. Paul and Stephen both pointed their finger at the other person during their interviews, and they both failed their polygraph tests. Obviously, we know that those aren't reliable at all. They're not admissible in court. They're fairly inaccurate. But I think it's worth noting. I think she was concerned for her well-being. Paul Hargrave says he and Crystal started dating in June after her divorce and suggests the relationship with her ex-husband was not an amicable one. I think she was wanting to get out of that situation as, as quickly as possible and move forward. I think that um, 
there was probably some animosity between boyfriends and husbands, and the husband probably might think the boyfriend had something to do with it, or the boyfriend might think the husband had something to do with it, which is exactly what we're faced with right now. But then investigators got their second big break from Crystal's car. Obviously, they weren't able to get any evidence from inside the car, but they were able to get CCTV footage of outside the car, and that told them everything they needed to know. They knew that if they could find who put that car there, chances are that same person had something to do with her disappearance. They ended up being able to pull surveillance footage from a Shell gas station next to the Motel 6. On August 26th, the same day that Crystal went missing, video evidence shows her black Mercedes being backed into a parking spot in the Motel 6 parking lot. Now, unfortunately, it was too dark and rainy to see who was driving the car, but luckily that didn't matter because five hours later, that same camera captured Stephen McDowell pulling into the gas station, getting out of his car, and walking in the direction of the motel. It's their belief that Stephen was there checking to see if the car had been stolen or not. And not only did he not get gas at the gas station, he is then seen on camera taking what looks like a big bag and stuffing it into a trash can, pushing it down deep enough to where it couldn't be seen. Now, unfortunately, because of the storm, when investigators went to the trash can to try and retrieve this bag, what they believe was a bag, everything in the trash can had been washed away by the hurricane. Now, I'm sure many of you are wondering how Stephen would have gotten home if he drove her car to the parking lot and left it there, which was 13 miles away from his house. And investigators are wondering the same thing. But when they looked at the area surrounding the motel, they were reminded of something. Early on, when they asked Stephen what he was doing the rest of that day, he mentioned something about going to Walmart. And surprise, surprise, turns out there's a Walmart right across the interstate from the Motel 6. So they pull security tapes from Walmart, and what do they see? Stephen, walking around the store. Not only that, he purchases a bike, and then he is later seen riding that bike in the direction of his home. And all of this is too much to ignore. Stephen, at this point, was still denying that he had anything to do with Crystal's disappearance. He was still trying to act like the helpful ex-husband who was still friendly with his ex-wife. But they knew that there was something more to this. And because they didn't have enough solid evidence at this point, they couldn't make an arrest, but they knew they were close. So then investigators reach out to Crystal's aunt, Cindy, and they ask her to keep an eye on Stephen and see if he went anywhere or did anything to indicate that he knew where Crystal was. Unfortunately, this didn't bring them any new evidence, but they also hoped that they'd learn something new from Texas EquiSearch, which is a volunteer search and rescue group who was conducting a large-scale search effort. But even after that, they had nothing. So at this point, they really needed Stephen to just admit to what he'd done. And after seeing the footage of him in the parking lot, him buying the bike and riding it home, they pretty much know he's their guy. And they start looking more into this amicable divorce that they had according to Stephen. And that's when they learned a lot. For starters, they learned that he threatened to kill himself and kill his family if Crystal left him. Then they also found out about the cruise and how Paul was invited and Stephen was uninvited. And they also learned that Crystal had recently told him she was going to stop financially supporting him. Oh, and there was one more big thing they learned. They found out that one of the times that Crystal had told him she was leaving, he actually did take the kids for a few days and didn't tell her where he'd taken them. And at the time, she ended up calling 911 and reported that he had taken them. But he returned and she ended up dropping the charges. And out of everything they had learned, they knew that that last bit of information was something that they could really use against Stephen. So on September 8th, two weeks after Crystal had gone missing, they brought Stephen back in for more questioning. And they show him the tapes. And at first, he adamantly denies that he is the one in the tapes. Eventually, it gets to the point where he can't deny it anymore. And he admits it's him, but he says that it proves nothing. There's no doubt in my mind that, that that's you. I want to show you that. I'm guessing you'd like to see that. And when it was clear that he wasn't going to admit the truth, Stephen was threatened with the reality that if he didn't speak up, 
his children would be taken away. And it turns out that the DA, who was heavily involved in this investigation, got in contact with CPS and got them to agree to remove the children from Stephen's custody. At that point, the kids were successfully placed with other family. They were safe. And Stephen was told that if he didn't speak up, he would potentially never see them again. And that's what made Stephen crack. And it really seemed by this point, the pressure and the guilt were starting to destroy him. He had lost a significant amount of weight in that last two weeks, and he just looked tired and weak. And then Stephen agreed to make a full confession, but he said that he was tired and he would give them what they wanted if they let him go home for the night and rest. He also agreed that he would take them to her body if they agreed to not pursue the death penalty. And surprisingly, investigators agreed to all this, even though they knew that he could go home and make a run for it. But what other option did they have? At that point, there was technically only circumstantial evidence against him. And if they arrested him that night, there was no guarantee they'd be able to keep him in custody without more solid evidence. So they kind of had to just hope for the best. So Stephen was released. And that night, he made a call to his daughter, Krista. I haven't mentioned Krista yet. She was his daughter from previous marriage, and he had been in and out of her life for years. So he calls her and he immediately starts telling her, I'm innocent, saying that he would never do such a thing. And she believed him. She believed that her father loved Crystal and that he never would have done anything to hurt her. She said she loved her father, that he was a good guy. He was funny. He was fun. And she just couldn't imagine that her father could actually do something like that. In fact, she was under the impression that Stephen was still going to be going on that cruise with Crystal and that he planned to propose to her even though they had recently gotten divorced. This was all Stephen's delusion, and Krista quickly figured that out. But despite him telling her at first that he didn't do anything, eventually he told his daughter the truth. In their conversation, he tells Krista that investigators are going to give him a lesser sentence if he can take them to Crystal's body. And of course, she's like, well, you can't do that. You don't know where she is. You didn't do anything. And that's when he spills it all. He tells her he did know where Crystal's body was because he was the one that killed her. He told his daughter to come see him, that it would be the last time that they potentially would get to see each other because investigators would be picking him up the very next morning. And they did. And once they got him back in the interrogation room, he confessed to everything. He said that that morning when Crystal got home from Paul's house, the two of them got in an argument and he just snapped. He confessed to strangling Crystal from behind so she didn't even see it coming. And then he put her body in a garbage bag and disposed of her all on the morning of August 26th. And I'm sure you're wondering where the kids were during all of this. Luckily, they were sleeping through all of it. They were still at home in bed. You've confronted her at different times about those affairs. Yes, confronted her. You think she tell me to stay home in business? She says that I'm not dominant enough to the bedroom. That's what she says. Were you fighting when that happened? Yeah. Is that when she told you that she didn't love you anymore? Yeah. And did you snap? <laughs> did you mean to suffocate her? No. It just happened. I didn't know that. Either. I love her. And how did you suffocate her? <laughs> Squeezed her. <laughs> I'm under, under, under. <laughs> okay, like a, a chokehold or something? Did she say anything when that was going on, or did you fight, or what, what happened? <laughs> she said I was scaring her. How did you eventually know that, that she was no longer alive? Stop it. So 15 days after she went missing, 38-year-old Crystal McDowell's body was found in a wooded area after Stephen led investigators to the place that he left her. And surprisingly, despite what many believed would happen, that Crystal could have been washed away, the hurricane didn't really have any impact on where her body was left. She was still in the same place. Stephen McDowell was then arrested and brought to Chambers County Jail, where he sat for two years awaiting trial. Finally, in June of 2019, Stephen's murder trial began. And if you thought he would go about this with cooperation because he did make a full confession, you'd be wrong. He made everything extremely difficult. And I had never heard of this, and I'm really surprised I never heard of this, but there is this charge in Texas called crime of sudden passion. 
And it allows a defendant to argue that they killed someone basically as a reaction to sudden emotion or passion. And sometimes with this charge, people can only get two years. And this is one of the most wild defenses I've ever heard used in a case. Even though Stephen confessed, he now was saying that he killed Crystal because of a hug that got out of control. I'm going to say that again. He claimed he accidentally killed her because of a hug that got out of control. He actually testified that they were fighting and he hugged her to calm her down and suddenly she dropped dead. That's actually his defense. And like I said, if he was convicted of this, he would only face two years for accidentally killing someone due to a hug. Two years. Obviously, no one in the courtroom bought this bullshit. Everyone in the public was just horrified that this was actually his defense. And luckily, the jury did not buy it either. After five days of testimony and three and a half hours of deliberation, Stephen was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. And as for their poor children, who were eight and five by this point, they had to be told by their aunt Cindy what actually happened, what their dad did to their mother. And the two of them lost both of their parents in very different ways. I have no words. I can't imagine having to comprehend something like that at that age. And I can only hope that now they're still getting the love and support that they need because the trauma that those two kids have had to face is just unimaginable. I read that they are in the custody of Crystal's ex-girlfriend, Mandy, and she is fighting for full custody. Crystal was an incredible mother. She worked so hard to give those kids the life that she never had. And it is just so unnecessary and tragic what happened to her. As for Stephen, he will be eligible for parole in 2042. Let's just hope that that does not happen. Obviously, her family and friends are hoping that by then, the decision is made that he stays in prison for the full duration of his sentence. It is commonly believed that Stephen did this in the spur of the moment, that he didn't premeditate everything. I am curious on your opinion on that because I just feel that the timing of it with the hurricane is very convenient. I don't know. That's just my personal thoughts, but let me know what you think below. But before I go, I need to thank today's sponsor, AG1, which you guys know, I am a big fan of AG1. I'm going to make my AG1 right now. I've been taking AG1 since either October or November of last year. I am a huge fan of AG1. I'm so happy that they're sponsoring my content because I truly believe in this product. It's improved my digestive system. It's really improved my skin and my hair. So I use the packet. I use eight ounces of water, shake it up, and let's have a good chug, shall we? AG1 has helped my immune system. It contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. It's amazing how much is packed into one scoop. It increases my intake of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, replenishes my daily nutrients. And just overall, I feel so much better when I take AG1. And I'm truly saying that the days where I don't take it, I notice it. If you guys want to check it out, you can get a year's supply of vitamin D3K2 drops, which are awesome. I take them every day, plus five free travel packs of AG1 at drinkag1.com slash Kendall Ray. And that is going to be it for me today, guys. I will be back next week, of course, to discuss another case. But until then, stay safe out there. 